Well, Pete, it's March now. We're getting through 2023. And let's start, as we usually do, with the inner solar system and work outwards. So the closest planet to the sun, Mercury. Um, actually, for much of March, it's fairly poorly placed. Superior conjunction occurs on the 17th of March, after which time Mercury does re-emerge favourably into the evening sky. Yeah. Um, and in fact, on the 24th of March, it's about magnitude minus 1.5, which is quite bright. And it's not bad for Mercury, is it? No, and it sets 40 minutes after the sun, so... That's not too bad. It'll be close to Jupiter at the end of the month, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, let's talk about Venus as well, which also has a conjunction with Jupiter this month. We're, we're going to cover the conjunctions in our enlarged specials section, I think. <laughs> There's a lot to talk March. about. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. Um, but Venus is a beautiful evening planet shining at magnitude minus 3.9. And as we said, it'll be close to Jupiter at the start of March. Um, but if you manage to see Ju uh, Venus rather through a telescope, it's showing an 85% lit phase at the moment and about 12 arc seconds across. That's at the beginning of the month, which is um, that's not the most exciting phase for Venus, is it? No, it's not. But it is quite interesting because uh, by this time now, uh, as you get down to this kind of phase, things like the cusp caps, which cover the north and south poles of the planet, start to become easier to see in smaller telescopes. And you do get this uh, the, the interesting cloud put patterns that are visible more in the bluer end spectrum. Uh, an interesting effect to watch out for, we don't know whether it will appear yet or not, is this wave cut discontinuity that oh, appears yes. in the atmosphere of Venus. It's only visible in infrared observations, uh, and it's best seen when the planet is in this kind of phase. Some, some elongations it's not there, some elongations it is. We have no idea whether it's going to appear. And there's some debate as to what's causing it. So if you have infrared setup, imaging setup, this would be a good thing to be doing. Are you talking about um, sort of general infrared or the deeper infrared, which we'd use for nighttime observing, nighttime of Venus? Uh, so uh, the, it's typically been caught uh, with a 790 nanometer filter. So right, okay. that kind of uh, wavelength that we're looking at. And it looks, is it, uh, it looks a bit like a straight line or straight line. It is, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. Uh, it's basically what looks like a straight line going north to south. Um, it, it has a, a lighter side and what looks like a dark shadow, though we don't think it is a dark shadow, on the other side. So it, it is quite noticeable uh, in imaging. And if you image over a, a few hours, if you're able to do that, you can catch it drifting with the planet's uh, upper atmosphere rotation. Venus's upper atmosphere has an example of super rotation. It goes much, rotates much quicker yeah. than the, the surface does and we're asking at the British Astronomical Association we are asking people who image Venus in infrared to send us their observations because whether it's there or not their observations are very worth having absolutely uh, one yes. way or the other a negative is as good as a positive absolutely well the thing which really um, is going to be exciting for Venus throughout this month is that it can be seen against a truly dark sky and that really emphasizes how bright Venus appears by the end of the month, Venus remains above the horizon from the UK for 220 minutes after sunset. That's nearly four hours. It is. The only problem is, of course, when in the dark sky, it is so dazzling. Uh, in a telescope it's almost the worst time to look at it <laughs> yes it is that's quite right i mean what what i was um, referencing is what it looks like when you look at it with a naked eye shining in the sky because it, it it's then it takes on that appearance looking a bit like a, an aircraft with its landing lights on coming towards you but you're quite right i mean the problem is that to see it through a telescope against a dark sky um, it is really dazzling but also that condition occurs when the planet is starting to get lower in the sky. So the atmosphere tends to wobble it as well. Yes, unfortunately, there are a lot of things that conspire against us as soon as we do that. Uh, one thing that you, you can try with the naked eye, though, is to see whether you can see any shadows cast by Venus. I've never seen this, but I know you have. and I think you might even have a picture of it, Pete. Uh, but it, uh, this would be a good time to try it if you if you can. Yes, I have amusing stories about that as well. But um, <laughs> I, the one way to do it is to... Um, well, I, I suppose I, I better mention what that was. I, I had a the first time I did it, I took a a roll of cardboard and put a target at the end of the roll of cardboard and some greaseproof paper 
at the other end. So it was like a telescope with a greaseproof paper at the, the bottom end and a target, which was actually the, the shape of the symbol for Venus, at the front end. And I pointed it at Venus to see if there was any shadow cast. And I photographed that on the greaseproof paper and it came out fairly well. And then I moved the, um, what I called the shadow scope. Yeah, original, very original. <laughs> <laughs> to the slightly off position, and I didn't get the shadow again. And I posted those results, and I had a, a an email from uh, somebody who will remain nameless from a... Um, uh, <laughs> A, an American organization um, called NASA oh. and sa said it, it, it wasn't a shadow um, from um, Venus. It was the sky glow uh, that was causing that. So a couple of years later, I did the same experiment, but this time put the target on a window in my house, which was west facing and I then photographed it on the opposite wall, the shadow cast by this target, and did it over a sequence of images so I could animate them together and I could show the whole thing moving, which was very clear. Um, I did send this off, but I never got a reply uh. back from the gentleman, and it may have been down to the fact that Patrick suggested what the target um the casting the shadow should have been, which was a clangor. Right. Uh, they may have thought so. you were perhaps not being serious. Maybe that's the... <laughs> anyway, this is a good time to try it for yourself to see if you can uh, get uh, the shadow of Venus. So it's quite a rare thing to be able to see. Yes. Well, let's move out now then into the solar system um, to find the planet Mars. Now, Mars was fantastic at the end of 2022, but it's now fading as its distance from Earth is increasing. Uh, the planet is about mag plus 0.4 um, at the beginning of um, March, with a disk which is about eight arc seconds across, so about half the size it was at opposition last December. But it's still big enough to show detail. It is. So I've seen uh, detail on Mars with that uh, with my eight-inch reflector at eight arc seconds. I would carry on. Now I've got my larger telescope, my twelve-inch. I will carry on till it gets down to about four arc seconds. It is worth eking out. Basically, Mars is going to be around for a long time, hanging in the twilight. So we might as well try and get something out of it. And it is worth yeah. watching. Uh, there are still changes going on on the surface. So I, I, I think it'd be interesting, for, certainly from an imaging point of view as well, to see what you can get. Oh, yes, you can definitely keep going, so long as the atmosphere is nice and steady. Um, Jupiter, well, Jupiter in March puts on a, an early month display with Venus. And again, we'll mention that in a moment. But it's now moving into the evening twilight. Jupiter's been with us for some time, hasn't it? Sort of Months and months. <laughs> it feels like years. It feels like it's been here for years. Well, that's because it's, it's higher in the sky, which is what we've been yeah. asking for. True. Um, True. But yes, so it's now moving into the evening twilight and we'll... Uh, we'll lose it really from um from view saturn is a morning planet badly placed during march and the the same is true with the other two actually um uranus uranus is still visible but its position is deteriorating throughout march and neptune is in conjunction with the sun on the 15th of march so it's not really visible this month um, but as we mentioned, there are a lot of special events happening during March. So we'll start with the one on the, um, the evening of the first and into the evening of the second, when Jupiter and Venus will appear really close together in the evening twilight after sunset. On the evening of the first, they're 0 0.6 degrees apart. And on the evening of the second, they're 0 0.8 degrees apart, which is really pretty close, isn't it? It is. Uh, if you consider that uh, the moon is just half a degree across uh, in the sky, then you can see that these two things are actually going to be quite quite close to each other. Uh, you should be able to fit them in the same uh, field of view in, in your telescope. Absolutely. And see them as disks. Yeah, so that would be interesting. Yes, it um, will. On the second, Mercury and Saturn join the show in that they are one degree apart as they rise together in the morning sky. Now, as we just said, Saturn isn't very well positioned uh, and it may be possible to see them in a blue sky after sunrise. Uh, closest separation of 52 arc minutes occurs at 1440, but I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge to see in the daytime sky. So it's a tough one, but not impossible. It's not impossible, but you need a really clear blue sky to be able to pick them up to do that. 
Um, on the 4th of March, if you get a view of the moon, the southern polar region is favourably tipped into view thanks to the rocking and rolling action of the moon known as libration. Um, so that's worth looking out for because there's some great craters in the southern part of the moon that, that move into view and some great m uh, mountains as well that appear quite dramatic when you um, see them tipped into view by libration. In fact, if you then go further through the month onto the 15th the liberation then favours the moon's northwestern region so that's a, a different area to look at so as the moon sort of goes around its orbit because its orbit is elliptical and tilted you get this sort of movement which allows you to see extra bits around the edge so it's well worth trying to see what you can see there. And some fantastic details on the in the southern uplands as well. Uh, they really are striking. I've never attempted yes. to really draw them. Uh, I just I just stand and watch. So I I enjoy that actually. I enjoy uh, when I take photographs of them, trying to decode what it is you can see there, and it's really hard because it is. the, the quite full a... shortening is enormous. There's, there's the foreshortening, and it always looks like quite a jumble of features. It could be quite, even for an experienced lunar observer, takes some time to decode which feature is which and which mountains are which. Yes, definitely. OK, well, on the 18th, if you have light pollution-free skies, you know, good clear skies, um, this is a good time to look out for a very gentle, subtle cone of light, sometimes seen towards the west about 90 minutes or so after sunset. And this is, of course, the zodiacal light, which yes. is quite a faint uh, uh, phenomenon to see. I have seen it once or twice uh, in La Palma. I don't think I've ever seen it from the UK. But if you do go to a dark sky, uh, or even just the countryside near by to where you live, uh, you have uh, a reasonable uh, view of this part of the sky after sunset, uh, you you stand a, a reasonable chance of seeing something, I think. You do. I have seen it from the UK. I've, I've actually seen the morning version in the autumn, um, but I've, I've also seen it from air, aircraft windows when all the lights have been turned out in the aircraft. And, um, yeah, it's, it can be quite striking. It's, I think one of the big problems with the zodiacal light is the fact that it's, um, it's quite large and it's very diffuse and it's tilted over to the horizon so it's not always obvious what it is you're looking at no in fact the first time i saw it i mistook it for mist <laughs> uh, well because it does have that kind of ill-defined boundary yes, it to it doesn't it yeah. it is not tricky it's not easy to see uh, but it is worth trying for um we also have on the 20th of the month the center of the sun crossing the celestial equator at precisely 21 25 ut and this of course defines the march equinox which in the northern hemisphere uh, is the vernal or spring equinox yes. which means that we will be starting properly spring and warmer times well the expansion of uh, the daylight period is at its greatest at this um, time of year the rate of expansion is at its greatest so when you go outside and pe people always do that don't they this time of year and in the autumn they go yeah, you really notice how the earlier evenings. <laughs> and, but there is a reason for that. It's because we're going through the equinox. It's the, the rate of change is fastest. Yeah, you're on that slight curve, which is the, really increasing in gradient. So the velocity is increasing. And you do notice it, as you say. It does become quite obvious. Yeah. Um, on the 21st, we have dwarf planet Ceres reaching opposition, shining at a brilliant magnitude of plus 6.6. .6. Um, this occurs in the constellation of Coma Berenices, Berenices hair, and it's just north of the Virgo galaxy cluster, so that's a, a nice one to but it's, watch out it's for. binocular range, easy binocular range, actually. Yes, so yeah. um, it's, a, it's a great thing to, to try and locate um, over consecutive nights because you can watch the dot of Ceres as it moves against the stars of that fairly tricky region of sky if you're not used to it, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it'll be worth keeping up with it because um, on the 26th, of March, Ceres passes across the mag plus 9.3 galaxy M100. Ah. So that's an opportunity to, to watch it as it does that. Does it pass um, right in front passage. of the galaxy? Yeah, the galaxy is fairly extended, um, but it will, yes. Let's hope no one mistakes it for a supernova explosion. Uh, has that ever happened in the oh, past? I wouldn't, know. I don't think so. Not by me. <laughs> it, it has, actually. There have, there have been reports with, um, I think it was Mars, wasn't it, With um, in one of the, the bright 
uh, nebulous regions in Sagittarius. There was a, a an alert went out saying a supernova had been detected oh, dear. in the region, and it happened to be the planet Mars. Oh dear! Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> All right, on the 22nd, the evening uh, of the 22nd, that is, we have a very slender 1% lit waxing crescent moon, which sits 1.8 degrees southwest of Jupiter, which will be a lot brighter, magnitude 1.9. Um, yeah. It's worth catching this tricky sight, but, and it's rewarding, but it will happen low above the western horizon about 7 o'clock, 1900 UT. But that will look quite pretty, I think. It will. It's, um, I mean, a 1% lit waxing crescent moon is, isn't that difficult, so long as you're looking in the right part of the sky, which sounds obvious. Um, but when, <laughs> it, when it gets lower than that in terms of percentage, it can be extremely difficult because the sky gets brighter and you can't really see it that well. But a 1% should stand out, and it'll be nice next to Jupiter like that. But um, over the course of the following evenings, there's a good opportunity to catch features on the Moon's eastern limb rotated into view again by a favourable liberation. And the eastern limb has some, some nice features. I remember a few years back um, getting a good view of the crater Humboldt, which oh, is yes. an yeah. amazing crater to look it, for. It is, a fa- it is a beautiful formation, Humboldt. So that'll be, a, that'll be a nice one to look out for. OK, well, the moon is um, in our sights again on the following evening, on the evening of the 24th of March, when um, it's at a 9% lit waxing crescent phase and 0.9 degrees south of the brilliant planet Venus at 1010 10 UT. So that's in daylight. So if you can catch Venus and the moon in daylight sky, you'll be able to see them together. Now, you you need to be careful, obviously, because the sun will be up at that time. Um, but if you can stand in the shadow of a house and locate Venus in the sky, which will be off to the uh, left of the sun or to the east of the sun, then it is possible, if you can see the, the crescent moon, actually, to, to actually pick out Venus next to it with just the naked eye. Yeah, so that would be quite a useful finder. If you've never seen, the, if you've never seen Venus in the daytime, you can use the moon to, to, to pick it up. Um, I actually do most of my Venus observing during the daytime because it reduces the glare. It's because you don't like staying up late at night. Um, la- <laughs> later, <laughs> after the sun has set, the pair form a stunning sight low in the west, of course, and um, the moon will have moved a little bit further away from um, the planet at that time. It's actually two degrees from Uranus as well on the 24th, the moon. So um, there's planets and moon all in that region. Okay, well, on the 25th, as the 20% lit waxing crescent moon approaches the west-northwest horizon, it'll be located really close to the Pleiades open cluster. And that's a good opportunity for a stunning photograph of that pair. When, When the moon gets really a bigger phase and much brighter and it's near the Pleiades the Pleiades are swamped and you can't see them very well but when it's in this waxing crescent phase it's a nice balance against the cluster stars so it's easier to get a good photograph of and it looks great visually as well it does uh, on the 26th, UK's daylight saving period ends at 0100 UT in the morning, and so we'll be going on to British summer time, so don't forget to take that into account when you'll make your observations. Also, Ceres, as Pete said earlier, will be crossing uh, the Galaxy M100 tonight and into the morning. Yeah. On the 27th, Mag minus 1.3 Mercury and minus 1.9 Jupiter are just 1.4 degrees apart, low above the western horizon in the evening after sunset. And then on the 28th, I told you there was a lot of special events this this (laughs) month, Um, the 39% lit waxing crescent moon sits 6.6 degrees from magnitude plus 0.9 Mars. And the pair is close together um, when they are setting at the northwestern horizon. And on the 29th, Mars sits 1.2 degrees north of the fifth magnitude open cluster M35 in the evening. Yeah, and to finish off on the 30th, magnitude minus 3.9 Venus sits 1.2 degrees north of mag plus 5.8 Uranus in the evening sky. And you can catch that pair above the west-northwest horizon after darkness falls after sunset, of course. 
So that's our list of special events this month. It's uh, it's quite a lot, a lot to do with the moon and the planets meeting one another, and um, so that sh- there should be plenty there for everybody to get a view of. And if you've got a phone or smartphone with a camera, have a go at trying photographing uh, Jupiter and Venus close together at the beginning of the month. Yeah, so it'll be a nice pair of thing to look out for. All right, well, let's move on now into the night sky. So we're starting a transitional change now. So the dominant constellations of winter, led by the magnificent Orion, they're now moving into the west. And as Pete mentioned earlier, because uh, the, uh, the the nights are really drawing out quite quickly now, yes. those constellations are starting to be lost. But if we look south, mid-north, um, and in the run-up up to midnight, Orion and its surroundings, they are there, but hanging around low in the southwest. Uh, but now we're getting the spring constellations led by Leo the Lion uh, appearing in the sky. And it's a very distinctive pattern, Leo. I always think it's quite easily recognisable in the sky. Um, it is, there's a shape known as the sickle at the front. This kind of resembles a backward question mark. Yes, it um, does. supposed to represent... The, uh, the the head and the front leg of the lion. So we've kind of got the lion sitting in profile. Uh, Looking the pun- to the west, yes. That's right. And the punctuation dot of the backward question mark, um, this is marked by um, Alpha Leonis, also known as Regulus. Which means the little king. Little king. In the, and anyone who's got a cat, a tomcat in particular, will know little king is quite apt. <laughs> <laughs> OK, to the northeast of Orion is the rectangular form of Gemini, the twins. And if you follow the line from Rigel, Beta Orionis, through Betelgeuse, Alpha Orionis, eventually you'll come to the twin stars Castor and Pollux in Gemini. And they are both fairly bright and reasonably close to one another. And they do look like a pair, actually, uh, they're often referred to as the twin stars, but it, if you look at them carefully, you'll notice that Pollux is slightly brighter and redder than Castor. I do notice that quite a bit, actually. Not least because my go-to telescope drive often chooses Castor as one of the target stars to align on, and it, it, there is a just definite orange colour to it. You use a go-to telescope? I For finding variable stars in the middle of nowhere, I do. Judge me if you like. Oh, I am. It's all right for you. All you, all you do is photograph bright objects when you can be bothered. So at least I'm putting something in. OK, so a line drawn from Regulus to Castor. So those are two stars we've mentioned so far. Um, can be used to locate the beehive cluster M44 in the centre of the faint inverted Y shape of Cancer the Crab. M44 lies fractionally south of the midpoint of that line. And the cluster can be seen with the naked eye under favourable conditions, but it's best viewed with a low-power instrument such as binoculars or or even a small telescope with a low magnification eyepiece in it. And it is a beauty, isn't it? It is is rather pretty. Um, No idea how anyone would ever think it could be confused with a comet, but that doesn't matter. Uh, It's a worthy deep sky object and does look beehive-shaped. It is, is, as you say, quite pretty. What, What does that actually mean? What? It looks beehive well, most shaped. Beehive, there's a beehive haircut, <laughs> wasn't there? That's kind of the sort of domed thing. And beehives generally, aren't they domed-ish? <laughs> it doesn't look like a dome shape. Well, it looks even less like a comet. <laughs> there, there, there is a little, there's a grouping of stars in there, which looks a bit, little bit like a house. And I've always assumed that was the beehive with the bees buzzing around it. Okay, I think we don't really know, but it is a beautiful cluster. And it actually, (laughs) Cancer contains another interesting cluster, but it's rather overshadowed by M44. This is the cluster M67. It's a lot fainter, but it's actually more compact and rich. It's quite an ancient cluster, in fact. It's very old, three to five billion years old, so quite old, really. Uh, So its formation would have been about the same time as the sun formed, so about a similar sort of age. Well, for a while it was thought that the sun might have actually actually been ejected from that cluster yeah which has well, <laughs> well that sounded convinced uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, the reason being is because we think stars form in clusters and groups and a lot of stars in the night sky are actually uh, binary do have companions but the sun doesn't so it, it is a bit of a mystery perhaps as to as to why that's the case but that is a beautiful cluster i've only ever seen it a few times well, I'm 67 I've, it is a fabulous yeah, cluster yeah uh, but you, you kind of forget it's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite close to the star Acubans, 
in cancer. That's the way to, to locate it. Um, but below cancer, you've got the sideways teardrop pattern, which we often mention, which represents the head of Hydra, the water snake, which is the largest constellation by area in the entire night sky. It's mostly made up of faint stars and so large that it takes about nine hours to fully rise above the UK's horizon. That's a lot of empty space taking nine hours to rise <laughs> above the UK horizon. Is there, there are a couple of things in uh, in Hydra, aren't they? Uh I There's the got... ghost of Jupiter, which is a, a lovely planetary nebula. Um, and then you've got Alphard as well, which is a, uh, a reddish-coloured naked eye star, the brightest star in Hydra, actually, Alphard. Right. Uh, there's a few things. It's not complete right off. <laughs> well, Pete, plenty to see in the evening sky and indeed the morning sky. Lots of specials this month, and I hope everybody gets some clear skies and gets to view some of them. So thanks, Pete. Thank you, Paul.